coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn. This is 112BK. On the show today, a psychiatrist on reasons for our rising suicide rates. We'll meet a member of the Little Rock Nine who took some of the first bold steps in the march towards school desegregation, now the subject of a new play. And cosplay and comics, the headliners at the upcoming BorougCon. Hi, I'm Ashley Ford. Welcome to the show. I'm back, yes, after another trip to Disneyland. <laughs> Mickey Mouse would seem an ideal antidote to the darkness looming over us right now, if it were only that easy. I've been thinking this past week a lot about Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain. Who hasn't? A lot of people are talking about suicide contagion, and I understand that a little bit as a person who has dealt with that in the past, who still sometimes deals with those thoughts, and who, when things like this happens, it's hard not to think about what might be or what might become. What I like to do, personally, is allow myself tomorrow. And you can allow yourself tomorrow as well. Calls to suicide hotlines are up 25% after Spade's death. But that means people are calling and they're trying to get help. A lot of people are trying to explain why suicide rates have been rising these past 20 years by roughly 30%. To tell us about some of the contributing factors, we're joined on the phone by Dr. John Mann, a psychiatrist at Columbia University who studies the causes of depression and suicide. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Mann. Thank you. Dr. Mann, in a recent article, you talked about the recession and housing crisis of 2008 playing a role in increased suicide rates, but studies show that the rate has been rising since 1999. How do you account for the overall trend? Well, clearly, economic factors do not explain two decades' worth of steadily increasing suicide rates in the United States. Mm -hmm. So other factors must be at work. Uh, we really don't know for sure what all these other factors are and how relatively important they might be compared to each other. But some examples of things that matter are um, uh, in 2003 and 2004, the FDA introduced black box warnings on most psychiatric medications. And given that 90% of suicides in Western countries have a diagnosable psychiatric disorder at the time of death, and 60% of those are a depression, um, if you put a black box warning around antidepressants, um, the result was pretty predictable. There was a decline in prescriptions of antidepressants for young people, um, initially um, adolescents and then later when it was extended to young adults. Um, those two groups had a decline in antidepressant prescription rates and the suicide rate went up in those groups. Right. In fact, in general, in the U.S., the counties across the entire um, North American mainland, uh, U.S. mainland, that had the biggest increases in antidepressant prescription rates and had the highest antidepressant prescription rates had the lowest suicide rates. Wow. Well, so Dr. Mann there is a relationship between medical care for depression um, and the suicide rate. So that's another factor. More recently, we have the opioid epidemic. Right. Uh, that's I'm from Indiana, so the opioid epidemic is something that obviously has been coursing through my state for quite a few, <laughs> like quite a long time. But I do want to, I do want to go back to the point that you made about mental illness. Um, over the course, uh, and, and mental illness playing a big role, because the CDC report says that 54 percent of people who die from suicide have no history of mental illness. Yes, but the CDC report um, had a, um, um, did not have a valid effective mechanism for determining if people had mm. um, a diagnosis. They relied on spontaneous reporting. But we know that when we do what we call a psychological autopsy and interview the significant others and loved ones um, of the person who died by suicide, we find that 90 to 95 percent of these people have a diagnosable psychiatric illness at the time of their death. Wow. And the CDC does have data on who was being treated um, at the time of death. And the rate of treatment of psychiatric disorders is 28%, which means that most of the people 
who sadly died by suicide, have an untreated psychiatric disorder as the principal and major cause. Wow. Wow. And what do you think about... Uh, this is something that I've been reading a lot about. Um, I know when that show on Netflix came out, that 13 Reasons Why, people talked about it a lot then. But the idea of suicide contagion, um, that people, when someone commits suicide and the conversation sort of wraps around that, that it then moves on and someone else commits suicide because they heard about it. Is that a real thing? Or is that just one of those things that we hear that scare us? No, that is a real thing. It doesn't account for a lot of suicides, mm. it's not like a big proportion, but it does account for a proportion. For example, we see that when a, um, um, a celebrity, uh, particularly, say, a pop star, um, dies by suicide, um, very often the press, instead of emphasizing the preventability and, and treatability of suicide, um, you know, focuses just on, mm. the, um, on the act and, and um, coming out of the blue, and um, as if it could happen to anybody. Um, and then this very famous person does it. So young people in particular um, identify with this individual, and those people that are already feeling depressed and suicidal, and if they're young, they're more likely to do it. For example, there was a very famous, um, 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 in Germany, a very famous... Um, um, a film that was shown which involved a young person committing suicide by jumping in front of a high-speed train. And that movie was shown twice, and both times after the movie, there was an increase, a little spike, wow. in high-speed train suicides by young people. Wow. Dr. Mann, I'm so sorry we've run out of time. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, though. I really appreciate it. A quick note, if you've been thinking in any way about suicide, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. That's 800-273-TALK. Coming up, a conversation with a witness to America's school desegregation history. So don't go away. For anyone, the first day of high school is a mix of apprehension and anticipation. Imagine the case of the jitters you'd have had if 61 years ago, you were one of the very first black students being asked to walk through the doors of the first all-white high school in the country to be desegregated. But only because the 101st Airborne Division was there to escort you. That's the scene at Little Rock Central High back in Arkansas in September 1957, and the setting for a new play called Little Rock. Here to tell us about it and why it's such an important moment to memorialize is its producer, Harvey Butler. Thank you for being here, Harvey. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. But we also have the great honor of meeting one of the first nine African-American students who, carrying her textbooks and the full knowledge that the world was watching how she carried herself, made it past the furious mob outside and into her new homeroom. At 14, she was Carlotta Walls. Today, she's Carlotta Walls Lanier and we welcome her to 112VK. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So can we just start, Miss Lanier? You were there. Mm -hmm. Walk us through that day. Well, I think the day that you are uh, speaking of is really the third first day. Mm. Uh -huh. uh, September 4th was our first day that we were denied the opportunity uh, by the Arkansas National Guard. Mm. The second first day was September 23rd, which we did get in. Uh, unfortunately, had to be removed quickly because over a thousand uh, mobsters were outside wanting to break through to get one of us, lynch us, or what have you. And there was only 17 policemen there to protect us. And September 25th was the day of the 101st Airborne that had been uh, the executive order of the President of the Uni United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. So we had 1,200 troopers there to protect us and to walk, to escort us into the school on that day. And um, uh, my feeling was on September 23rd, well, we, we finally made it. Mm. So it, it took three weeks and, um, to get to that point. So I, I do want people to understand that we had that escort. We had fixed bayonets, uh, the military did. 
They were all up and down the hallways. They did not come into the classroom, mm -hmm. but they escorted us from one class to another. So there was a sense of protection. Wow. Wow. And you know, you guys seem so courageous. And we think of you guys as so courageous yeah. now, heroes. But at the time, could you see the historical context of what you were engaging yeah. in? To be honest with you, no. I was 14 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed, yes, I saw the media there and so forth, not as you see it today, but they right. were there. Um, and all we wanted to do was to go to school. We had right. a right to mm -hmm. be there. And that's the point that needs to be understood, that there was a uh, Supreme Court decision that mm -hmm. gave us that right to be there. And not only that, the uh, Little Rock School Board had uh, uh, put a plan in place mm -hmm. to exercise that right, and um, we were there to take care of it. To go to school. <laughs> to go to school. Absolutely. Yes. To get and the best education available. That yes. That was really the, the, yes. the key. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Harvey, give us an idea. You know, you hear about this, and you know, we definitely, we've read books about certain things, we can picture it, but you, I mean, but now it's a play. How much of this, the, dram the like dramatic element of this, the historic account of this, how much of that do we get in the play? You will get a heavy peppering of yeah. it. Um, you know, taking actual facts from first-hand sources mm -hmm. and turning it into something that is dramatic, that people actually want to pay for it and, mm -hmm. and see, uh, is the secret sauce. Yes. Right? Um, producing theater was not my primary avo avocation, still mm -hmm. is not, it's right. my secondary, mm -hmm. that I've come to sort of acquire a, an appreciation for. Um, but this young Brooklyn writer, director, um, Rajendra Ramoon Maharaj, mm -hmm. has spent and invested the time with the Little Rock Nine to gather their stories and to translate it into something that can be staged mm -hmm. and that can be entertaining. And so when you come to the theater, uh, you will go through every range of the human emotion, mm -hmm. from laughing to crying to cheering to um, being uh, feared or fearful, um, uh, having fear. Uh, you will um, you will want to run out and uh, start singing. Uh, you will, you know, grunt and cheer when you hear some of the gospel music that got them through. So there, there's, a, and it's a play with music. It's mm -hmm. not a musical. Um, and so you'll you'll get the appropriate sort of range of theatrical elements that uh, you'll walk away from the theater saying this was uh, this was time and money well spent. I'm not gonna lie, what you're describing sounds like some of the best days of church. Like going like <laughs> to church as getting really, you know, because you receive that message and church is not a musical, but you right. get that musical element. Right. And it just sounds to be like just very, mm. very um, celebratory mm. in a certain way. Absolutely. Um, but also a learning opportunity. Absolutely. I think a lot of people don't really understand or really get the history. Mm -hmm. And I know that you haven't seen this particular production, Carlotta, I've, but you have seen renditions oh, of yes, the show. Very How much does so. it make you feel when you see it? It makes me feel good. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that um, Harvey here decided to be the producer here and to, because we, we are, are on the same um, plane here about mm. teachable moments. Yes. And this, to me, is a play that, with music, that mm -hmm. is a teachable moment for those who, uh, especially for the new generation of people who really don't know their history. Now, oh, yeah. That, that part bothers me. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that this is the opportunity for people to uh, get back to understanding why they sit in, in a classroom with others that don't look like them, right. why we are saying some of the things that we're saying today about diversity and so forth. It's yes. all in this play that yes. this happened 61 years ago, mm -hmm. as you stated. and. Um, 
we, we, you know, if we don't watch out, you know, history is repeating itself. That's very interesting because, you know, one of the key elements that, and you mentioned it right away, is that through executive order mm -hmm. from President Dwight Eisenhower, right. were we able to, were you able to attend school finally? That's um, It doesn't seem like we're going to get support of that measure from this president, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the fact that it does seem like we're in a very unique place of opposition mm -hmm. in this country? Well, a play like this one mm -hmm. is one that will uh, uh, get the attention of mm. people again and, to and, and hopefully they'll be able to see what took place then and what is happening now. Um, there, there are so many opportunities for people to talk about um, the fact that there are laws that are on the books that mm -hmm. are being denied to people, that are, are, are there trying to change those. Mm -hmm. um, we have, there's been a lot of progress yes. since 1954, and if we don't watch out, We're that, going to, it, that yes. progress is going to dwindle. Yes, and, uh, I see that. And I also, you know, and I, excuse me for interrupting, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I get this in while we have time, but Brooklyn and New York City as a whole has some of the most segregated mm. schools mm. in the country. I see. Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones at the New York Times has written about this extensively. Um, but what difference do you see between what was going on then and what's happening now? Well, I'm, I'm seeing some of the same things. Mm. Uh, that that's, Not enough of a difference. Right. I mean... Uh, even though we've had all this progress, mm -hmm. okay, um, there are factors out there that mm -hmm. will try to twist things and 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 change things again. Um, you know, I don't particularly care for segregated schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mm -hmm. believe that we li live in this global community. We need to get along with each other, understand each other, Absolutely. be able to um, converse with other uh, other people, mm -hmm. um, and. But because of education, I'm mm. going to go back to education now. If you don't have it, you can't get to the next level. Mm -hmm. And once you get to that level, that helps you to get into a neighborhood that will afford you different opportunities, different opportunities, access to different things, right. places that you want to be. Harvey, I, I have to think that some of these concerns are why you would help produce a play like this. Yes, yeah, so for me, uh, I went to high school right around the corner. Mm. I went to Brooklyn Tech. The only reason I was able to successfully get through that test, which they're now trying to change the test mm -hmm. itself and to sort of, uh, sort of dilute it a bit, mm -hmm. uh, is because I went to a, uh, a, I went to a desegregated school. Mm -hmm. I got bussed out to white neighborhoods in the late 60s, early 70s in the mm -hmm. Flatlands section, the number one elementary and junior high school. And it was through that rigor, my mm -hmm. cousin and I were in the SP track, which was the highest track. It was the rigor of the education. It was the, it was the weekly reader. It was mm -hmm. this little prompter that would throw words up on a screen and it would change its pace. So it would blink the words and then it would increase the speed. And you would have to, through reading comprehension, understand at its highest pace of words blinking on the screen what was just flashed in front mm. of your eyes. Right. It increased your capacity for comprehension. Mm -hmm. It was just that mental muscle yeah, the practice memory and it. the mm -hmm. practice and yeah. right? um, there were, you know, spelling bees and there mm -hmm. were, you know, rigorous mathematical mm -hmm. exercises. Right. And if you needed help, you got it from the teacher. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were in school with these white children and some of them didn't want us out there, right? right. But we went anyway. And we didn't go through what the Little Rock Nine mm -hmm. went through because they opened the door for us. But it was that whole experience that I had. Absolutely. In Different understanding challenge. this story that a lot, I came kicking and screaming into mm -hmm. becoming a producer. This is not something I wanted to do. <laughs> right. Um, and it was the, the gentleman who I mentioned, Rajendra Ramun Maharaj, who wrote the play, who stayed on me and said, but we need you producing. We need people like you producing And specifically this. you, because you understand. I understand. Right. And I, I got think it. people who understand are so lovely there. Yeah. Um, I know you guys have to get out mm -hmm. of here. We have to wrap it up. Sure. So really quickly, Harvey, how do people get tickets? 
uh, go to littlerockplay.com mm -hmm. uh, and hit the, the ticket button. It'll take you. The location is the Sheen Center, which is in the East Village, mm -hmm. North Houston, on 18 Bleecker Street. Um, the social media is Little Rock Play mm -hmm. and Instagram or Twitter. Um, and it's going to run through September 8th, and Ooh. we just need people to come and support it so we've to got keep the time. doors open. Yeah, no, we've got time. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. but Thank you got to bring them out. But we got to bring them out. Thank you so much for sure. being here. My it's pleasure. such an honor. I Thank can't you. wait. I hope people are busting the door now. Thank, oh, you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks Thank you for having us. Three days of workshops, panel discussions, and contests with everything on the schedule from your favorite comic book character to, quote, playful transgression to gender normative coding. That's BurrowCon, and it all starts the cosplay, the awesome anime, and the villain worship on June 15th at the Brooklyn Expo Center in Greenpoint. Here to talk about cartoons and cause positivity are Aston Mack, BurrowCon CEO. Thank you for being here, Aston. And Rashad Florence, Director of Marketing. Thanks for being here, Rashad. Glad to be here. Thank you for having us. I'm so happy to have you guys here. Before we get to the event itself, for those not familiar with this world, with cons and things <laughs> like this, how would you explain it to them, Aston? I would say, take TV, mm -hmm. now make it real. And that's you, and that's essentially what you get to do when you're con. Anytime that you ha um, you have a television show mm -hmm. or any form of art that you're interested in, you start a forum with that. You have you have these groups that you discuss it with. You mm -hmm. add to that. That's what BurrowCon is. It's for that gathering of people. Like you watch your t favorite TV show. Mm -hmm. Now come out with all your friends and let's talk about it. Let's get the actors in on it. That sort right. of thing. That's TV IRL. I love it. Can you give us an overview, Rashad, of what this year's BurrowCon is gonna be like? What can attendees expect? Uh, for this year, attendees can expect a lot of things to do. Uh, they, we've got events, panels, and games happening, for example, throughout over the course of the weekend. We're gonna have several fighting game tournaments for the fighting game community. Uh, that includes Dragon Ball Fighters, a hugely popular game based off the Dragon Ball franchise. Uh, oh, yeah. There's gonna be the new Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle fighting game. Uh, we're gonna have a few cosplay contests, panels involving our guests. So we're gonna be having wow. like our voice actors come out, talk about what it's like being a voice actor, probably give some few tips here and there. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a whole bunch of other stuff, especially with our actors. Oh my gosh, this sounds yeah, amazing. Aston, what's your like one thing that you're like, okay, for me this is like, I know all of it's amazing, but it's like this is unmissable. If you miss this, you messed up. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, throw my little nerd hat in here. I'm a. Yeah. I started my life in esports. I've mm. started from the for a very long time. I've done a lot of different esports competitions, mm -hmm. run a lot of tournaments in that respect. So for me, where I got my start is video games. I'm super duper hyped. We've got a cut. We've actually got an ex um, exhibition match between two pros. Uh, playing out, and we're going to be giving away like we're giving five hundred dollars away to uh, to for one of the prizes for the Dragon Ball Z game wow. and stuff like that. I, I personally, I'm into sports, so esports just makes sense. Right, that makes sense. How many artists, Rashad, are coming this year? Like artists specifically? <laughs> Ooh, that's a big question. <laughs> Do you know? Sixty-three. Sixty-three. Yeah, Yes. 63 artists. Whew. Can I ask you really quickly, Rashad, and I ask you this specifically because you're the marketing person <laughs> here. Um, so obviously Black Panther happened and we're all still recovering. <laughs> um, do you think that the success of a movie like Black Panther leads to like successful opportunities for a con like this? Yes, of course. Yeah? Uh, because with uh, the success of like the movie itself, you create an entire new audience of people mm. who want to get involved in that culture. You now have like more people who want to cosplay T'Challa. Like mm -hmm. for example, like as soon as the movie came out, there's so many like African Americans who are excited about being like on screen yeah. and like being able to like actually have action figures and toys and things like that with, that look and like reflected. Right. What they look like. Plus, fun right. fact: Fabian Nikenza writes Black Panther. Yeah. Really? Yep. Mm -hmm. The current the current line. Okay. So Didn't he's going to be one of our guests there. He also he's also the co-creator of Deadpool. What? Yeah. And, okay. And the that. most <laughs> prolific writer for the X Squad, which were the big guys in there, and he wrote Age of Apocalypse. I'm I'm sorry. I'm There's nerding just, out. No, that's okay. Please, nerd. I love love and nerd. Speaking of nerding out, 
Which is better, guys, sub or dub? Uh, I personally prefer dub most of the time. Mm. So, like everything nice, there's a lot of nuance. If mm -hmm. we're talking about 1990s, 2000s, I have, to, I have to hear it in Japanese all the way. Okay. If it's newer, the dubs have caught up. We actually have a lot of great voice actors coming, Charami and Bryce. Um, right. They're the lead guys for Sword Art Online. Mm -hmm. Voice acting has come way, 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 way far. So right. actually the newer stuff, I actually prefer the dub a lot of the times. But when it's older, you want to sub. Yeah. So we're talking about, with anime, the difference between <laughs> subtitles yeah. and the dubbing, which is the voice. Over. Yeah, which, let's, let's be real, the old school, like, Naruto voice is not so great, but... No. The new school, like we're talking Hunter x Hunter, fantastic dub. Right. So how do we get to the con? How do I come to Borough Con? How do I make that happen? Oh man, I'm, you know I'm awful with directions. <laughs> so <laughs> so here, here's the thing. Yeah. You, you find, you take, I, I know that you guys are aware of this, the center of Hipsterville, mm -hmm. Williamsburg, right? Yes. Right there on Noble Street, the Brooklyn Expo, that's where it's going down. Fantastic. And if I want to get tickets, so I just go to borocon.com. You can go to borocon.com, or you can actually just show up to the venue day of, what? purchase your tickets there. We offer either daily tickets or we uh, weekend pass, which is generally cheaper for, than someone buying even two separate day tickets. Right. That way, you can come back and see what else you might have missed that what isn't going on one particular day. Catch a guest or a panel you might have missed out on, That's and things fantastic. like that. Uh, this sounds Amazing. Yeah. What else and, are you saying? Yeah, I was about to say, like, of course, one of the big questions we're, we're always getting is, like, how do I, like, physically get there? How do I commute? Mm -hmm. What's parking like? like? And we know that's going to be a, a little bit hard because, like you said, Center of Hipsterville, there's probably other events, people checking out other, like, venues already that weekend. We decided to partner with Lyft again, mm -hmm. we, as we did last year, and they've actually provided us with ride codes. So if it might be your first ride with Lyft, you might end up with a free ride. Or if you're already currently a Lyft customer, you do get uh, a, re a reduced like ride ticket. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So this is how people come. This is fantastic. I hope that, did you want to say one more thing? I'm yeah, can, can I ask you a quick question? Because you apparently are resident nerd around oh here. Yeah, you can't do this. <laughs> I'm doing this right now. So I'm, I'm sure you know some of the objects that we've given you as a, as a gift here. I do. Um, this one in particular, mm -hmm. uh, what are you looking at? I am looking at Chief Gordon mm -hmm. and Batgirl. Mm -hmm. And she is... She's jumping at him. She's Th jumping at him. This is actually an original print from Mark McKenna. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, those in the comic book world will know it. Yes. And the whole theme here, because we, we are completely aware that Sunday is Father's Day, mm -hmm. it's fatherhood, the greatest superpower. Okay. And the first 500 dads that show up with their, uh, with their child will actually get a free poster signed by Mark McKenna himself because That's... we want to make sure that every, every kid gets a superhero dad. That is fantastic. You both are fantastic. Thank you so much for being here and talking about this. Thank you. I can't wait for the doors to be busting down for <laughs> BurrowCon and people coming to get this, which, you know, actually it might just be me and 499 of my friends. Thanks for watching. Tomorrow on 112BK, as Pride Month hits week two, voices from Gay Black Media and the composer of a new opera about Noah's Ark, told through the voice of Noah's wife, Naama.